Hello and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my ongoing series of videos celebrating getting 1,000 subscribers. Thank you all over again. Now today I thought I'd look through some oddball books that I've collected over the years in my library. Books that are a bit unusual, a bit different and uh, take in literature, non-fiction, all sorts of things. I want to kick off with this book, Phantom Islands of the Atlantic. This is a really fascinating book written by a cartographer, a map maker, Donald Johnson. And what it is, is it goes through all the maps through the centuries. And map making was a very dodgy business before technology got going. And there were often many mistakes made. And what happened is that because voyagers and researchers, they went to these same lands, but they didn't realise that they'd gone back to the same place. So they doubled up and they created worlds that weren't really there. So for centuries, there were islands on our maps that didn't exist. And some of them, the, the information about them was incredibly detailed. Take Frisland. Now that is a map of Frisland. That's its geography, that's all the places in it, that's where you can go in it. It never existed. According to charts, for almost, I think of almost about 200 years, Frisland was on charts. It was supposed to be in the middle of the Atlantic. It never existed. There's another island called Antilia off the coast of Spain. And they've got seven cities listed as being on the island. It never existed. Frisland was actually, they now think, it was the Faroe Islands and the Shetlands. So they'd misnavigated. They, they hadn't quite worked out where they were, you see. So they doubled up on it, and it had become this whole new world that was never there. And he traces the history of these islands, how they first came into maps, how they developed on maps, and how they eventually dropped because they weren't real. It's a very interesting and unusual book, and I highly recommend it. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, just a secondary book that I'll recommend, Atlas of Remote Islands. This is a really beautiful book, but this is devoted to real islands. Islands around the world, like Ascension Island and Bear Island and lovely St Kilda off the coast of Scotland. Beautifully illustrated with a, a small text on each island, in a Pitcairn Island and so on. It's absolutely gorgeous book. I'm fascinated by islands around the world. Uh, one of my favourite places in the world, uh, the place where I would live if I had enough money, is Easter Island. I went to Easter Island. Easter Island is the, the most remote place in the planet, meaning it's the furthest away from any other settlement. And it's a good, you know, thousands of miles off the coast of Chile. It's part of Chile. And it's where all the big stone heads are, you know. And there's nothing else there. It's this beautiful island. It's very remote. And it's just full of stone heads. It's got one small settlement. It's got one small little town, really. Very laid back, wonderful laid back feeling. And part of the reason that the original tribes people on the island died out is because they cut down all the trees. So it's quite a barren island. It's not like Tahiti or, you know, your vision of a South Seas island. It's just, it's just, it's green, but it's just grass and, you know, a hilly top. And I found it really beautiful. It's really serene. It's really calm. Very little goes down there. And there's lots of big stone heads. And I thought, this is my paradise. And loads of islands like this are covered in this wonderful book. Highly recommended if you have an interest in that kind of thing. One of my favourite people ever, certainly one of my favourite people of the 20th century, is Orson Welles. And I'm actually much more interested in Orson Welles, the man, than I am the filmmaker. I mean, God knows I love Citizen Kane, Magnificent Amsons, Chimes at Midnight, they're brilliant movies. But Orson Welles, the man, I think was one of the great men of the 20th century. He's such a brilliant orator, such a brilliant speaker, such an intelligent man. And I've watched pretty much every interview you can find with Welles online. There's loads. And they're all fantastic. He, he speaks brilliantly. This is something a bit different. My Lunches with Orson. A fellow filmmaker, not a very good filmmaker, Henry Jaglon, befriended Orson Welles. And they started having lunch together, and Jaglom taped them. Isn't that a bit odd, taping your meal with your friend? And he's transcribed these meals, right? And it's a very different Orson Welles that emerges. He's a very sort of bitter Orson Welles, a bit bitchy, you know, complaining about how he can never get a film made and bitching about all these colleagues and people he doesn't like. 
And there's very surprising moments in it. So like, for example, Richard Burton comes up to the table and Wells just completely blanks him. And Burton is crestfallen. And Henry Jadalom says, well, why did you do that? And Wells says, well, as you can see, I'm eating. But then, you know, Jack Lemon turns up and he goes, here he is, and gives him a great big bear hug. So there's all sorts of little, you know, gossipy things about Wells in this. For people who like Orson Wells, it's a very mixed bag, this book. It's very, it gives very mixed feelings. Because on the one hand, you feel that Wells is being betrayed a bit by someone who says he's his friend. But on the other hand, it gives a real look behind the curtain at a famous person and what he really thinks. It's kind of fascinating, addictive. Another fascinating person also involved with cinema is Marguerite Duras. Now, Marguerite Duras is probably best known to people watching this video as a writer. Um, she was famously, she was a partner of Jean-Paul Sartre, and then she was a huge part of the, the Nouveau Roman in the, the 60s in France with, with books like Moderato Cantabile. And that's how most people know her. You know, I read a review uh, of Marguerite Duras in the London Review of Books, and it didn't mention once that she was also a great filmmaker. But in the world of cinema, she's known as a major director. They didn't even mention once. And yet cinema appears in her writing all the time. A bit bad, that. Now, this book, The Wartime Notebooks of Marguerite Duras, is really for Duras completists. The vast majority of the book is not terribly interesting. It's just drafts, you know, of her novels. But the first 50 pages I would recommend to anyone. They are incredible. It's basically her diary of what happened to her when she was a young girl growing up in French Indonesia. No, uh, sorry, Indochina, sorry. You know, as a sort of daughter of a colonial family, a French colonial family. It's an incredible story, right? So she was put in this private school. And while she was in this private school, when she was about 12 or 13, she was wooed by a local businessman, you know, about 20 years senior to her. Wouldn't happen these days. And the, the, the family kind of semi-encouraged it. And so she, he would drive up in this kind of Rolls Royce and take her for rides, you know. Incredible story. And she tells it in this kind of really cold, matter-of-fact way. You know, you can tell she was a tough woman who was very clear-sighted about life and people. And it's just jaw-dropping. It's a jaw-dropping tale told, you know, by this brilliant writer in a very clear, precise, no-bullshit way. And it's an amazing story, you know, and it's worth buying this book just for the first 50 pages alone. The rest of it is not worth much of your time, but those first 50 pages are incredible. Now, I'm not a great sports fan. That probably means no surprise to people watching this channel. Um, you won't find me watching football or golf, you know, or rugby. So it might be a surprise that I've got this novel in my collection, and I have read it, The Damned United by David Peace. Now, part of the reason I bought this book is I was intrigued. Here was a literary novel around football, right? Or soccer, if you're in the States, right? Now, it's, it's a common cliche that there is no such thing as a good football film. Football fans are always bemoaning the fact that you never get a good football movie. I was intrigued. Could you make a literary novel, really, about football? How's that going to work? And so I decided to read it. And actually, it does work. And it's strangely compelling. It's, what, it, what is interesting about this book is it's about the story, the true story of Brian Clough. And Brian Clough was already a famous manager in England. And he'd been very critical of Leeds United. Leeds United were the top team in the league. But Brian Clough said that they were dirty. They were always fouling people. They were a bad side. They got, they got all their titles through fouling people and being aggressive and being violent, right? They had been run by this incredibly famous manager called Don Reavy. Don Reavy left. And to everyone's amazement, Leeds United employed Brian Clough to take over from him. This guy had been criticising them all these years. He lasted a month and they kicked him out. And this book is the story of that month or however many days it was. And Peace writes it like this kind of 
vivid, almost Jacobean tragedy. It's very violent in its language. And it's, it, you know, it starts with a Yorkshire curse. I curse thee, you know. It's like Brian Clough has walked into this kind of particularly Yorkshire kind of hell where they're going to get him and run him down. It's, it's, it's almost biblical. And it, it, it's kind of fascinating to see football written about in this way. Some of you may be familiar with the film version made of it with Charlie Sheen. Not Charlie Sheen, Michael Sheen. <laughs> Uh, it would have been better with Charlie Sheen. Um, and I can tell you now that's a very watered-down, diluted, sanitised version. The book is far harsher, far tougher, and far better. If you want something different, try it. It's really interesting. Now, staying with Yorkshire. This was a favourite book of mine when I was a child and a teenager. The Penan UFO Mystery. Aye. This is great. I, I, I loved all this mystery stuff and UFOs and Loch Ness Monster stuff when I was a kid. And this was one, a peach of a book. There was a point around about 1980, when I was eight years old, when there was a spate of UFO sightings across Yorkshire. And this coincided with a very strange incident. A body of a man was found on a slag heap just inside a coal yard. Now this man, he was an elderly man, and there was no one knew how he'd got there. He'd vanished the day before. There was no sign of how he could have got up on top of the slag heap. There was no footsteps, no dis dislodged rock or anything. He'd just been dumped there as if from above. And he had a weird burn mark on his neck that was exuding this sort of sticky substance and no one knew what it was. Very strange. Had he been experimented on by aliens and dumped from a UFO? It's a great story. And, and I particularly like the fact that it's set in Yorkshire, you know, at Todmorden, you know, on Bennines. Um, and I was kind of completely fascinated by this as a kid. Um, most of those kind of mystery books don't compel me anymore, but this one written by Jenny Randalls is great fun. As I was trying to find this for this video, I came across this book. Um, I used to read this when I was a kid, This Hollow Earth. This is something that fascinated me. You know how people used to believe in a flat earth? They also used to believe that the earth was hollow and that there was another world inside. Look at that fantastic cover. You know, uh, a spiral staircase going down deep into the earth. That obsessed me when I was a child. And I thought this was a really interesting idea. There's a particular story in this book that I love. These guys uh, were doing aerial surveys of the North Pole. So they were flying aircraft across with, you know, aerial cameras, right? And they got back to base and one aerial camera, it just showed a great big black hole, perfectly circular, where the North Pole was supposed to be. Clearly some kind of fault with the camera. But they couldn't prove it. All these experts looked at the camera, the, the camera photo, and they couldn't prove it. And so people started to believe this was an actual hole in the Earth which you could fly into. And apparently one of these flights, um, they found that when it got back to base, it had flown far more miles. Than, than it actually should have done. So they, were, they thought, had it actually flown into this hole by accident <laughs> and flown over this sort of interior landscape and come back again, that sort of thing obsessed me when I was a kid, and I loved it. So those are two rather wonderful mystery books for you. This is rather wonderful. Anyara. I didn't know about this until about two years ago. It's a Swedish epic poem from the 1950s about science fiction. Isn't that great? Did you know that existed? Apparently it's well known in Sweden. It's written by Harry Martinson. And it's about this story about these people are going to go off to Mars to colonise Mars. But their ship is knocked off course and they can't turn it around. Something's gone wrong. So they're just piling off into deep space. And they can't turn around, they can't go back. And so they're basically, they're just going into nothingness. And it's about how they, they, they try to create a community on board the ship and they try to keep existing. And eventually they just, they just get worn out and they all die. And the, the ship becomes this great big moving sarcophagus through space. It's a sci-fi epic poem. How can you not want to read that? Getting a bit more serious now, folks, a bit more serious. 
Capitalist realism. Now, don't go away. I know that that title is not very inspiring. But first of all, this is a very thin book. And I think it's a very interesting book. Now, it was written by a guy called Mark Fisher, also known as K-Punk. That was his blogging name. He is a leftist um, philosopher and blogger and commentator. His entire blog is collected in this brick of a book, uh, K-Punk. He died very young, sadly. He died when he was 54, so he's not around anymore. This is a good entrance into his work. Now, why am I recommending this? Many years ago, I started to think about something that I didn't see anyone else articulate it, and then I saw Mark Fisher articulate it in this book. And the way he put it is this. Imagine, right, you took someone from 1958, and they were just seeing the emergence of rock and roll, right? You took them to 1978, and you showed them how popular music had developed, it would be like they were in a different universe. Punk, Bowie, Kate Bush, the Beach Boys, the Doors, Pink Floyd. It was like a quantum leap. You know, you could never have predicted that back in 58. But now, take someone from the end of the 1980s, or 1990, say, and then bring them forward in a time machine and show them popular music now. Now, I'm not saying it's the same, but there is nowhere near that difference. Coming into popularity at that time was rap music, it's still popular now. Coming into being was the Stock Aitken and Waterman tinny, you know, kind of pop music, that's still around now. R&B, still the same. There have been some movements, some different voices, but the change in popular music and the amount of creativity is nowhere near in that 30-year period as in that 20-year period between the 50s and the 70s. Why? Fisher is one of the very few writers I've ever come across who identified that problem, the stagnation of culture in the West. His diagnosis of the situation is that what's happened is that with the falling of the Berlin Wall, capitalism, you know, uh, was it uh, Fukuyama said in the end of history, ca capitalism had won, right? So it no longer had to keep defining itself. It had nothing to define itself against, right? So it stagnates. It doesn't have to keep proving itself. And capitalism always rewards what has always been. So if someone likes this, they'll just reproduce it over and over again. You don't have to move forward creatively. That's his idea, right? a leftist take. I don't know whether that's right, but I find it really interesting. And what I find interesting about Fisher is that he's a philosopher who looks at life through popular culture, through music, through film, through television. And I tend to go along with his taste, actually. So I think he's a really interesting read. So this stuff might be intimidating for a lot of people, but actually this is a really good accessible read, a really good introduction to modern philosophy. Highly recommend it. Let's, let's lighten up a bit. You know what? One of my favourite people, one of my heroes, not many people I love and admire these days, but I do love and admire Bob Mortimer. God, I love Bob Mortimer. I think that his stories on Would I Lie to You, um, I'll leave a little link, you can, you can access, someone's put them all together in one video. They are one of the great joys of living in the last 20 years on this planet. They are so funny. And this book is basically, this is his autobiography. I don't read biographies or autobiographies very much, but I had to buy this. And it's like him telling you those stories, right? It's like your best mate down the pub telling you his life story. It's really funny, it's really laid back, and it's just a great read. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's, it's so funny. I mean, it's also a great story. You know, Bob Mortimer, you know, he was quite depressed in his youth. And for a long time, he was pursuing a career in law in London while he was homeless. He was living in a doss house. And then, you know, just by chance, he got to see Vic Reeves doing his stuff above a pub. You know, Vic Reeves' big night out. And they made friends. And that saved his life, and he became, you know, a famous comedian. So it's a great story. 
So, you know, even if you don't like Bob Mortimer, I recommend this book. It's really funny. Quick plug while I'm here for another autobiography. Another autobiography that's really great fun. Tom Baker's, if you've never read it, it's a riot. It's an absolute riot. It's so irreverent uh, and scabrous. Um, he starts out training to be a priest, you know, in Liverpool. Then he has all sorts of adventures, tries to kill his mother-in-law at one point. It's full of lies, tall stories. It's absolutely wonderful fun. And finally, indulge the boy in me. You know, when I was a kid, right? On TV, the good kids watched Blue Peter. You know, that was a nice magazine programme for nice middle-class children about good things, right? And, you know, you know the, the bad kids, they watched Grange Hill or Magpie on ITV. Well, the same sort of thing happened with kids' comics. You know, bad kids were reading, you know, the, the, the sort of Marvel comics or 2000 AD or the Beano, whereas good children got Look and Learn. Do you remember Look and Learn? It was a very nice magazine. It had lots of stories about kings and queens and battles of the Napoleonic era and all sorts of, you know, edifying content. But in the back pages, I know about this because my, I subscribed to it for my news agent for about two or three years, was the Trigon Empire. And this was this really exciting, epic sci-fi, kind of based loosely on the Roman Empire, but on another planet, beautifully illustrated by Dan Lawrence. I mean, the artwork is absolutely gorgeous. I'll try and find just fantastic artwork, old style 1950s style artwork. I used to, it's just gorgeous to look at. And, and this was a special treat. So for all these, you know, posh kids or, you know, nice kids who liked learning and reading books, they got a little treat at the back, this kind of exciting sci-fi adventure in this far off planet. I have started to collect it again um, to remind me of my youth. It's really good, the artwork is beautiful. It's stunning. So there's some offbeat books from my collection. I'd love to know of other books you prize that are perhaps not so well known. And uh, look forward to more 1000k subscriber videos coming soon. Thanks very much.